As we go through this program, Lord, and please help us as we all leave here today, Lord, learning something, Lord. And Lord, please help us, Lord, and please bless the speaker. In Son Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Jordan. I remember when I was taller than he was. Kimmy, where's, oh, there she is. Aren't our young people doing a great job? She's another one that's shooting up. All right, Kim. Kim will be giving us the scripture for today. A scripture reading will be taken from Psalms 104, 25 through 27. This great and wide sea in which are innumerable seeming things, living things, both small and great. There the ships sail about. There is the leaveth in which you have made to play there. These all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. Amen. All right, uh, welcome again. Um, we want to thank Sister uh, Dr. Camille Gaines for being here this afternoon. And I wish there were more young people here to see this program that she'll be uh, given. But guess what? She brought her family with her. Her dad, Collie, is back there with his daughter, her sister, and my brother's son, Howard and his wife, they're here to support her, and we're here to support Dr. Gaines. Um, you know, we, that's not going to make me grow. <laughs> but you know, Dr. Gaines, um, I rem remember her as a little girl, and over the years, you know, I, I remember attending her uh, high school graduation, and you know, the years passed, a few years, and my brother told me he was going out to California to her graduation for her PhD. And so he went out and uh, he flew out and they drove back. And he was telling me a story, I have to relay this because I was talking to her about it. On the way back from California, they had a flat. And the way he was telling, telling it to me, I thought they were out in some desolate place, you know, desert on one side and mountains in the foreground. But actually, it was in uh, Oklahoma at a motel, a hotel where they spent the night. So, you know, what he did was he had to get the donut out of the back of the car. She had a Prius. And taking the donut out, he, she had a lot of stuff in her car. And when he was telling the story, he said, I left her by the side of the road. She, she was actually sitting on her suitcase, she said. But he had to go and get a, a new tire to, you know, get the flat fixed. So I thought it was a desolate highway, but they were actually in a hotel, motel at a parking lot. So, but they had another road experience in North Carolina, if I may tell him that, tell him that story. Uh, we were having a family reunion in North Carolina, Tennessee area, and the GPS sent them on some mountain road, gravel road, one way, one lane road, and he said he wasn't going to back up if there was another car, you know, coming. It was quite a hilly country where we were, but uh, we all have experiences in family, and we, you know, like to talk about them sometimes and laugh. But let me uh, try to get up Dr. Gaines's, uh bio here and read a little bit about who she is. I need this glasses here. Just give me one second. Yeah. Okay. It's a little lengthy, but I'll read it. It says, originally from Philadelphia, Camille established a love of the water at an early age. She grew up as a competitive swimmer, 
but it was not until she entered Hampton University as a marine and environmental science major that she realized she could turn her passion for water and the ocean into a career. Upon graduating from Hampton U University, she started a, PH started a PhD program in the ecology and evolutionary bio biology department at UCLA, UCLA. She spent the majority of her PhD research examining the factors that promote algal proliferation in coral reefs. She spent two years as a postdoctorate at the University of Penn in the biology department where she uses molecular techniques to assess how the taxonomic composition of algal communities change when there are changes in herbivory and nutrients. Wow, it's hard to read that. Currently, she works in the biology department at Penn State Brandywine. There are two things Camille loves about being a marine scientist. First is the sheer amount of knowledge the ocean holds. It gives her countless opportunities to learn and explore. Second, she physically enjoys being underwater. There is something about being totally submerged in water that is common for Camille. She got involved in black marine scientists, black marine science, because she loves being black and she believes it is important that we highlight black stories as a way to combat, combat anti-blackness. As chief science officer, Camille works to advance the research of black and marine science members, which in turn changes the narrative around who we consider to be scientists. So, I, I'm sure there's more I could read, but that's what you have here. So Dr. Gaynus uh, presently teaches at um, Penn State University, Brandywine, as I said, and I'm gonna let her give the rest of the program. I don't know anything about marine biology. So come on up, Dr. Gaynus. Uh, yeah. You guys can hear me on this, right? Smart. I would just prefer to use that. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Okay. Let go of it? Okay. Can you hear me now? All right, cool. Oh, well, this is a dress, so I, I'm just going to hold it. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, my uncle reached out to me and was like, hey, would you mind doing a presentation on what you do? And hopefully, if you, re if you understood anything from the bio, I love the ocean. So any opportunity I have to engage with people on the ocean, especially people of color, a lot of times, and we're going to talk a little bit about this um, as I go through some of my slides. Um, but we've been excluded from the conversation. So any time that I can engage us on the ocean, how we feel about it, and getting more involved and understanding the changes that are happening, I jump at it. So today, the title of my talk, my presentation is called Underwater Cities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about why that is. You know, when we think about the ocean, we think about it from the surface, right? It's calming. It might all look the same, right? But when we actually go under and we dip our head under, we can see that there's a ton of different organisms and they're extremely diverse. Here you can see in this photo, um, here you can see in this photo, there, this is a coral reef, right? And these are corals. But in this photo here, we have algae, right? Both right below the surface, same depth, but totally different communities. And so I say that to say there's so much knowledge in the ocean. There's so much living organisms. But I'm gonna talk about one community in particular. And before I kind of get into the nitty gritty, I just wanna show you all some photos. And I'm gonna call on a couple people just to tell us what they see. What do you say? An octopus. Does everybody see that? Yes. Yes, yes, y'all can just call it out. Yes. 
I heard Nemo. Yes, Nemo is right. Do we know who, what Nemo is, what type of fish he is? Clownfish, yes, yes. Do we know the name of his home that he's living in? A coral, I hear a coral. It's not necessarily a coral, but it's a, not necessarily a reef, but they do live in reefs. This is a clownfish. What kind of fish? Oh, what did you say? A sea anemone, that's the name of his home, yes, yes. Yes, yes, this is a black tip reef shark. Yes, these are corals and we have fish. This one's a little bit harder. I'm, I think I heard, did someone say seahorse? Eel, no it's not an eel. A tree snake? A sea snake, no. But it is, I think someone said seahorse. This is very closely related to a seahorse. It's known as a pipe fish. Mm -hmm. This is a lizard fish. And you can see here, right, it's very well camouflaged into the coral. So camouflage is a very important skill for a lot of organisms that live in the ocean. It helps them to evade predators. We're just gonna do a couple more. <laughs> There's a lot going on in this photo. So yeah, there's algae in this photo. There's fish, yes, there's corals, yes. There's, so there's a lot going on here. Am I right? And we can see in a very small space. And just one more. Is it a C? What did you say? It's not a sea cactus. This one is probably one of the hardest ones here. It's actually a type of worm. They call it a Christmas tree worm. And what happens here is you can see the part we're looking at is its tail. And it's burrowed down into this coral, and it uses that tail to collect particles of food that are passing by in the water. And at certain times, that tail will come in and it'll eat. And so I, we kind of touched a little bit about it, but what is something that all of these organisms have in common? They live in the water. Let's be a little bit more specific. <laughs> Let's be a little bit more specific. Yes. Yes, all of these organisms you can find in a coral reef. And that is the community that I study. And here we just have a photo of a coral reef. You can see from the other photos, right? The reef, the life that lives in the ocean is very diverse and very unique. And here you can see tons of corals, right? All different colors. And the name of my talk is called Underwater Cities because we can really equate a coral reef to a city. They're extremely important, they're extremely biodiverse in the sense that you have a lot of different types of organisms and, or animals living in a very small space. You can almost think about the city of Philadelphia, right? We have all different types of people who live in the city. We have all different types of businesses, all different types of natural landscapes in the city. And so here goes a map. Coral reefs are unique, though. They, you can only find them in a very specific portion of our globe. Does anybody know what portion and why we find them in specific places? See some folks shaking their head. Tropical? Yes, that is exactly correct. The corals that we're going to be talking about today, they live in a very specific region, and it has to do with the temperature of the water. And we could almost draw a line as to the regions that we find coral reefs. And it's right, you're right. It's in these regions that are, have extremely warm water and warm for most of the year. And we call it the coral reef because it's made of that foundational species, right? That foundational animal, which is the coral. And corals are actually animals, right? They are not plants. 
They're more similar to us than they are the trees outside. They eat food, um, they grow, they reproduce. Some of them reproduce sexually, some of them reproduce asexually. And so why are coral reefs important? Okay, okay. Fish population, that is a great one right there. Let's go for that one. One out of every three fish spends a portion of its life in a coral reef, even though coral reefs take up less than 1% of the whole ocean. So I say that to say they really are hot spots for biodiversity, and when we see them being rem removed, then that has very strong implications for the amount of fish that we will have globally. But something else, this young lady over here said that they are important for protection. What exactly did you mean when you talk, said that? Okay, she talks about the nutrients of the ocean. She says she thinks that's why that, one of the reasons why they're important. Yes, that is true. But coral reefs are unique in where their nutrients are. You wanna? They, they provide hope for the for that marine life. So they just mm -hmm. like our hope that protect provide protection from the outside. Mm -hmm. The sea life right here okay. is very you know, sea currents move things around. Mm -hmm. That's home for them. It pro provides food and protection from all the elements mm -hmm. around them. That, and they are important, very important for protection. Um, for, from a protection standpoint, those communities that live close to a coral reef, when there are large storms, the coral reefs actually absorb some of that energy because of their complex structures, so you have less damage on the coastal lands. And when you see corals being removed, and now you have a flat reef, that energy is not being absorbed. So you have now that energy being absorbed by those coastal communities, and you have she's, more damage. She's coming up the street. Did anyone else want another reason why coral reefs are important? She don't understand. Tourist attractions, tourist attractions. Yes, tourist attractions is a big one. A lot of communities make a large portion of their, their economy through ecotourism, through people coming there. And then on top of that, right, you now have jobs for the folks who live in those communities. Given that uh, they make food and they, that means they might be getting nutrients from the water, can they be used to purify the water, make it a little bit cleaner? Yes, that's, um, that's a very important point. Oh, thank you so much. Um, that's a, a very important point. Um, a lot of the organisms that live in a coral reef help to keep the water what we consider clean. Right, there's not a lot of things that live in the water that you find coral reefs. That's why if we were to go there now, you know, I'd be able to see my toes, right? The water's clear. That's very different than what we get in the Atlantic. And if we were to actually take a jar of water from the Atlantic and a jar of water from a tropical system where we have coral reefs and look at them under a microscope, we would actually see that that water from the Atlantic would have a ton of stuff living in it. We'd see things darting across the microscope. We would see a lot of lot smaller organisms. That's different than what we get in a coral reef because most of the organisms are much larger, right? And so we don't have a lot of organisms that live in the water column. And that's because corals like the water to be clear because they have partnerships with other animals that help them to photosynthesize and they get that energy. And so reefs are changing. How many people here have heard that coral reefs aren't doing well? Just by a show of hands. They're not doing well. All right, I see some hands, yes. But what does that mean, right? We hear that they're not doing well, but there are actual things that we can see as to why that is. And a lot of times what that means is, you can see in this photo here, I have on your left-hand side, it's a reef. That photo was taken in November of 2007 in a small island in the South Pacific. 
There's a lot of hard things there. You see there's corals, right? If we compare same spot in 2020, 2010, I'm sorry, now you see there's like a fuzziness that covers everything. A lot of times what happens when we say that coral reefs are changing is we have a coral dominated state going to algae dominance. And that's what, show, what I'm showing you here. We have a coral system in November 2007, and then we have now that system where we had a lot of corals, like you stated, the coral itself actually is the home for a lot of organisms being removed, and now we have it replaced with algae. This particular scenario was caused by a sea star. This sea star actually eats corals. And so when you have this sea star in huge abundances, right, you can see how that would just ravish a whole coral community. And what happens is corals grow very slowly, but algae does not. And so if the opportunity presents itself, you can now have algae taking over the spaces where that was once coral dominated. And algae is extremely diverse. When I say algae, you can think of me saying plants, right? They're extremely large plants. They're really small plants. There are plants that flower. There are tons of different plants. Some only live in the tropics. Some only live in cooler regions. And this is just an example here. These, these photos all are, organ, are, all are algae. In the top left, we have a brown algae. In the middle and the top, that's another type of brown algae, but it looks green in this photo, right? We have, to your far right, two types of red algae, and then on the bottom, we have another type of green algae. I study a very small algae, it's about this big, and this algal group, and we call it a group because it's comprised of a whole bunch of types of species, is called turf algae. And when we talk about how these events that remove corals, a lot of times the first thing that replaces that coral is this group. But if we say it's left, quote unquote, unchecked, or it has the ability to continue to grow, it can transition into much larger algae, which is even more a detriment to corals. A lot of times a large macroalgal or algal assemblage like you see on your right it has bacteria that can cause coral diseases. So now corals don't want to be next to that patch of algae, right? Because it'll make them sick. There are two, a couple things that cause algae to grow. First is fish, or the lack thereof, right? When you don't have the fish eating the algae, then it just has the ability to continue to grow and take up more space. The next is nutrients. We talked about how in a coral reef community, there are not a lot of nutrients just readily available in the water, right? That's why we don't have a lot of small animals that live in the water. And so my questions have been as a researcher, why is this, right? How do these two factors come together and affect algal growth? This is the island where I do most of my research. It is in the South Pacific. It's known as Morea. It's in French Polynesia. If you're looking at this photo, you see there's an island closest to you, and there's one a little bit further in the back. That island further in the back is the island of Tahiti. Morea is about 17 kilometers northwest of the island of Tahiti. And on this island, we know that herbivorous fish are important. How do we know this? is the home of a long-term ecological research site, or an LTER. There are LTERs all across the world. And really what this is, is places where scientists say, okay, we're just going to study these natural systems over a very long time frame. Because we know the metrics that a lot of organisms work on is much longer, right? And so the longer we study these systems, the longer we see the things that are impacting them, we can have a better sense as to how we can conserve them moving forward. But on the island of Morea, like most coral reefs, right, fish are being removed. And they're being removed at very alarming rates. And they're being replaced a lot of times, or not necessarily being replaced, but the dominant herbivore or things that eat algae become urchins. 
And so a lot of times as a, my PhD, right, I'd come up with questions, right? I'd observe a lot of things and come up with questions and see, okay, how can I create a study? What information would I like to gain and then disseminate about this community, about this question? And so I quickly want to just talk about one small project that I did just so you can gain a sense as to the life of a researcher, the types of ways that scientists go from question to not necessarily answer, but getting more knowledge. And so because now we have urchins as one of the dominant um, herbivores in these communities, I really wanted to look and see, can they rise to the occasion? Are they able to reduce algal growth for, or algal proliferation? I know in the bio my uncle read there might have been a lot going on in some of the sentences. He said, ooh, that's, that's a lot. But really, what we were studying was how much algae can these urchins eat, right? Because we know that if they can eat a lot of algae, then that's a good sign for corals, because now we'll have very small algal communities that won't overgrow corals. And so what we did, I worked with the team, and we set out to see, OK, well, first we need to find a reef that has a lot of urchins, right? It has a very low um, abundance of fish. And what we do is we do surveys. So we go out into the ocean, we lay down a specific length of a transect, and we'll swim along it and count whatever it is that we're counting. In this case, it was fish. We also did something similar where we went out and we were diving, and instead of having a long transect, we had what we call a quadrat. So it's a specific size, and we'll lay it down at specific places and count how many things we see. And in this case, we were looking at urchins. I'm going to quickly go through some of these graphs, but I want you to just get the overall sense as to what our conclusions were, and they're going to be at the top. And so here it says herbivorous fish abundances were low, low at gum. That was the site we did. And how do we know that they were low? Well, we compared them, right, to other sites. And because Morea is the home of that LTER, or long-term ecological research site, we could look at that data that they've been collecting since 2005 and compare those fish abundances to what we see. And you can see here, right, we have our site. And then to the right of that, we have three different sites that were a part of the LTER. We have three different color bars for each one of those sites. That represents a different type of fish that we saw. And you can see our gum site is much lower than the other three. So we know now that there are not a lot of herbivorous fish there. We then, we then did the same thing, right? But looking at our quadrats and counting urchins. And it's a similar thing, same setup of a graph, right? That site gum right here, that first bar, has a lot of urchins. So we see now the scenario that I started off talking about, where we had a reef, right, that had a lot of urchins, but not a lot of fish when compared to other reefs. And so I'm just gonna quickly go through our experimental design. So I'm what you call a field scientist, although I do employ molecular techniques. But a lot of times what a field scientist does, they go out into a natural system and they might manipulate certain things in that natural system to see how that community is going to change. A lot of times we do that because we believe that in the future this reef could look like that or this system could look like that, or we want to see how can this reef change if we start to do some type of conservation, right? If we reduce the amount of nutrients, if we make this a marine protected region. So field studies are really good at kind of those implications because in a lab, right, there's a portion of that laboratory experiment that's not realistic to what we have in a natural setting. And so I say that to say, we went out to this reef, we manipulated, so we actually excluded some urchins, right? Because if they're able to graze down the algae, if we exclude them, then we'll see that this algae is growing. But that's the implication. And the implications for that is, 
if something were to happen to that urchin community. And we've seen this in the Caribbean. That's one of the most known cases of where we had herbivorous fish populations that were decimated and they were replaced by urchins. But then the urchins actually were removed because of a wasting disease. And once the urchins went through that wasting disease, you saw this algae really growing and proliferating and you saw corals really not able to recover in a lot of places in the Caribbean. So we didn't just manipulate urchins, we also wanted to see their ability to remove um, and their influence with sediment. A lot of times when we're talking about natural systems, they're not being impacted by one or two changes, it's maybe three or four. And so that might change how communities um, interact with that, uh, with those cha environmental changes. And so we wanted to make sure, of course, right, we deployed cages like you see here, and we wanted to make sure those cages were realistic and they were actually keeping urchins out, right? Or that fish weren't a were able to get in to graze. Because even though we, were looking at fit, we weren't looking at fish, we wanted to make sure that they were able to graze into these cages that were open. For urchins, they eat at night, and so what we did is we went out and did some night diving to make sure that the urchins were able to graze in those cages. And so I'm just gonna quickly go through some of our results. The first, when it came to urchins' ability to remove sediments, which is a good thing, we saw that they were, that they were able to do that. And you can see that here on those no sediment added plots, those bars are lower than those where we added additional sediments. And so the implications there is if you have sediments being added to these, er these turf communities, search, sediments carry nutrients and that can help the algae to grow. And so you have even more of a cycle, right? Where you have more sediments, you can have more growth of algae because they're now transporting more nutrients. We then see, and this is a comparison of the, the bars um, within each of the groupings, we see that now urchins were able to maintain shorter turf regardless of the sediment type. So this is, these are all good things, right, for the community in a sense that we can have a less amount of turf, a less amount of algae to compete with corals than we might have the case where corals are able to recover. And I wanna just, say something, algae is not all bad, right? It's one of those things, there's a level to it. But when we see much more algae in a reef, that's not a good situation. And so I wanted to give you just a little brief understanding of what I, one of project I was a part of, but now I'm gonna transition a little bit um, and just talk about how I got involved with marine science. As my uncle stated, right, I'm from Philadelphia. I grew up in Mount Airy. So how was it that I was able to become a marine scientist? And this is kind of where it started for me. Here on the screen, you can see there's a photo of me. I was about three years old. And this was taken at the daycare that I went to. I went to the Roxborough YMCA daycare. And through the program there, I was able to do swim lessons. And so when my uncle talked about how I enjoy being in the water, I truly do. And I found that passion at a very young age. Of course, I didn't know then that I was gonna be a marine scientist, right? Um, it was really here. When I was in high school, I did a program at the University of Penn. And I worked in a lab that was studying different environmental factors. And I met people who were working for the um, Environmental Protection Agency, the National Oceanic Ad Atmospheric Administration as well. And it was the first time I met folks who were interested in science, but weren't doing anything medical related. I kind of assumed, oh, I like science, I like chemistry, I like biology. I'm gonna be a nurse or I'm gonna be a medical doctor. And so this kind of changed my outlook on how I went about looking for colleges. And so as my uncle said, I went to Hampton University. Um, I was really fortunate while I was at Hampton. I had internships. Every year I was there, paid internships. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that because 
anybody who is interested in marine science, there are many paid opportunities out there, and we're going to talk about where you can go to look at for some of these. And these are just some of my photos of me in my favorite place, the ocean, right? Um, both of one, the photo uh, on the left was taken in Morea, the island I showed you, where I've done the majority of my research. And the photo to the right was taken in Indonesia. We're going to do another pivot slightly, because I am a black marine scientist. So my experience is unique compared to the majority of my colleagues. This is a graph here, which you can't necessarily see the numbers, but the column that I'm pointing to shows the number of black African Americans who received a PhD in 2019. That's the year I graduated. The number is four. Yes, four. So this is, graph is showing you, and this was compiled by the National Science Foundation, the number of black African Americans who received a PhD in ocean sciences the year I did is four. Even though they gave out about just over a thousand. I like to give these numbers because I'm telling you there's room for growth. Right? My philosophy when it comes to my profession and science in general is that science would only benefit from having a diverse group of professionals tackling these questions, because these questions are real, right? Our natural systems, our communities are changing because of it, and we need the best team to help address these problems. But I don't think that's gonna happen unless we take down these exclusionary barriers. It's been my experience that it's not because we're not interested or we can't do it, it's simply that we've been excluded from the conversations. And I love to use my position to change that, because it has to change. I navigate a lot of spaces that look like this, where I'm one or maybe two people of color if I'm lucky. But that's not the case in nature, right? I started off showing you this photos of coral. And just look at the different colors, right? There's a diverse group of corals in this photo that you can see. Same thing with fish. We know that most natural systems, most coastal ecosystems need a diverse group of fish. Same thing when we go to tide pools. We need invertebrates. We need different types of algae. We need different types of bacteria. And the more diverse those groups are, the healthier that system is. And even right here with the kelp farms. And so this brings me to my next point, which I'm going to skip this. Black and marine science. In 2020, I became a part of, at the time, we weren't a nonprofit, but we have now grown to a nonprofit known as Black and Marine Science. I have some pamphlets here, as well as some brochures that outline some information that I'm just going to talk to you about. We have three main goals. The first is to support Black Marine scientists. I told you, I showed you the photo, right, of my experience where I may be one or two people of color in a whole space. But if we can link this person of color and that person of color around these thousands of labs and these thousands of places, then we can have a community. The next is we want to change the narrative on who we think, who our society believes is scientists, right? I can walk into a space, people don't expect I'm going to be the one giving the presentation or I'm going to be the one running this segment, or this is my lab space, right? Because that's just not what we see. But that has to change, and that's just for everybody. And the third thing is, we want to help mold, and we want to help support the next generation of scientific thought leaders, right? We want to be able to reach back to that community. And we do this through a variety of ways. We have a YouTube channel, where we have videos that come out. Uh, I think I'm having a technical difficulty here. Okay. Okay, yeah. We have a YouTube channel and we have a series of videos. We have these videos called BIMS Bites 
where we have marine scientists like myself, but also those who are just very interested in the ocean. They do five to 10 minute videos on a variety of topics. And it's a great way, especially for students, to see people who look like them studying the ocean. We pay all of those who contribute content to do this. We also have videos more talking with um, scientific professionals. For example, Dr. Dawn Wright, in just a couple weeks, is going to be make the world record for going down to the deepest depth as a black person. She's going to be going to a place called Challenger Deep. It is 10,000 meters, about 30,000 feet below the surface. She's going to break that record. And so we have interviewed her yesterday, just talking about her experience, getting folks excited. There's going to be a variety of things as she's actually traveling down to that space. And then when she's there and the work that she's doing, where they're go you're going to be able to it, it come in contact with her and in interact with her. We want to make sure that our community knows about this. And so we interviewed her, right? That video is going to drop on our YouTube channel. The first week of July is when it's supposed to. So we do things like that as well, right? Making sure that folks know what's going on in our community. We have memberships. In our membership area, we have a space for people of color to talk with one another, right? To talk about the problems, to come up with solutions. We also have a Padlet. It's a place that has over 50 paid opportunities. These opportunities range from internships, to speaking engagements, to folks looking for graduate students, to career opportunities. All of these, again, I'm gonna say this again, is paid opportunities, okay? There should be, if you are interested in being an ocean scientist, even if you're not, and you think, oh, maybe, let me just try it out, is a great place for you to go and see the availability of opportunities out there. And so I just, again, I say all these things because black and marine science is a place for us built by us. And we do a lot of work to make sure that um, our voices are heard. We just were in, I myself was just in uh, DC right now. We just finished up um, Capitol Hill Ocean Week. And so Ocean, World Ocean Day was on Wednesday. And so there were a suite of different um, initiatives released by Biden and other congressmen about how can we protect our oceans. We wanted to make sure that we had a seat at that table, right? And so we met with different congressmen. We talked to them about how can we make sure that the people of color who live in these communities especially are a part of that conversation and they have a seat at that table. And with that, I'm gonna stop. I've been talking for a long time. Um, there are pamphlets here. Um, I'm gonna leave some all with you as well. But if you have any questions for me, um, please, please ask. And thank you for your time. Have you explored the coral reef in Trinidad um, on the I Tobago, Tobago, um, thank you. the reef? I have not, I have not personally, huh. um, but there are some of our black and marine science members who do research. We recently are a part of a um, collaboration with um, the University of South Florida, yeah. and they've actually been doing, which it sounds wild, right? They've been doing some um, reef conservation <laughs> for about a decade. And they just now have started to think, huh, how can we actually bring members of that community into our conversations? And this is what I mean, like, yes. you know, they, it's an afterthought for them. And it shouldn't be, that should have been the first community that they go right. to. And so I say that to say, we just had some members who were in the US Virgin Islands. Yes. They went to Belize and they're going next year to Trinidad and Tobago to do some work looking at the conservation that USF has been doing and trying to incorporate that community more. Thank you. Um, uh, I know you're here, but aren't oh. you scared going down there seeing those sharks? No. <laughs> no, no, I've been diving since 2013. I've done thousands of dives. I've interacted with sharks many times. I've never felt unsafe. Um, there are organisms that I do feel unsafe around, but sharks are not one of them. But it's also one of those things, right? Like, I'm familiar with sharks. I know their behavior changes when they're ready to eat or when they're ready, you know, when they, it changes. 
I'm familiar with that. And if I were to see a shark behaving like that, then I would call the dive and go back on the boat. But I've, I've never had that happen. Thank you, because I'm not going near the water. No, 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 no. See, okay, no, no, no. Now you know, if you're on the hook, right? You know someone who dies. You know someone who's very comfortable in the water. I'll hold your hand as we go in the water and do our thing. But there's no reason, there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> can you? Can you speak to things that we can do to make the oceans and the coral reefs healthier? That's a great question. And it's the hard question because my philosophy when it comes to ocean conservation is it's like a highway. We each have a lane. And so the things that I do might not be conducive to your life. But one of the things that I am adamant about is making those who really do have the power accountable. By making sure that those businesses, those companies, our politicians are accountable for what's happening and can make decisions to do better. Because you and I can do stuff, right? But it's nothing compared to what Walmart or a Target can do. Even just small things, like changing the sizes of cats, right? Or there's a, there's a hotel, instead of giving out small plastic bottles, they changed how they gave out their um, the, the lotions and the body washes. And those things make huge differences. I mean, huge differences. So I say that to say, I would encourage you to go to Black and Marine Science. Follow us on Instagram or Twitter because we're consistently talking about certain things and there may be something that piques your interest. But I think as an individual, um, it's hard for us to all say, we're all gonna do this, right? Because we have such different lives. But there are things that we can do. You, you kind of answered it, but I'll act anyway. Um, so you do your research, then you have like, for instance, in developing countries, you have the fishermen. And then the one picture you showed was a, the picture of the, I think it's the parrotfish, mm -hmm. right? Which yep. is a delicacy in a lot of developing countries. Mm -hmm. And how does the message, because that's important to the, the coral reef, mm -hmm. and the other one, the doctor fish, like those two fish, are, those two fish are very important to the coral reef. Mm -hmm. But for the local fishermen, that's food mm -hmm. on their table you know what I mean, for their kids and, you know what I mean? So how do you get that method from your research mm -hmm. to that level to say, hey, it's important that you don't uh, catch these fish, especially at a certain time of the year, give them a chance to reproduce. Like, how does the message go from, from you guys to that level? So that's a very good question. And a lot of times when we're talking about uh, marine protected areas, so these are regions where government comes in and saying, okay, we're going to protect specific things. And a lot of times for fish, that means that you can't fish there. And there's different levels to it, right? It can be you can fish at certain times of the year. But what you see, and we've actually seen this in Morea, where we, they have started to, not started, they did, they've been doing this since maybe about the 90s. And they have protected certain parcels, but they see that outside of those parcels of land, of ocean, there's a lot more fish. So what they call that the spillover effect. So if you can talk to these fishermen, right, and say, hey, okay, this region, this small region here is going to be protected, they're gonna see the benefits in other regions. But that's not always the case, right? You look at a place like <laughs> Indonesia and the Thailand, a lot of their reefs are a lot more overfished. And so it's harder to get those spillover effects because you're already working with a community of fish that's much smaller. And so it is a case by case scenario. But again, this is why folks like us who live in these communities have to have a seat at the table so we can come up with solutions, right, that don't just negatively affect all the fishermen, right, or all the local communities. Oh, um, oh. oh I'm sorry, did you have a question? Okay. And, and one, 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 actually. Uh, you piqued my interest when you talk about 10,000 feet down. 10,000 10, meters, that's 30,000 feet. Yes, Dr. Dawn Wright is gonna be going deep. <laughs> that, we already call her deep so Dawn, but it's gonna be deeper Dawn. I thought it was, what's the maximum that depth has a human been down there and come back up? Oh man, I don't know. Yes, I thought 10,000 feet beyond us. So she's gonna be in what you call a submersible. Mm -hmm. um, but there, so Challenger Deep, is not the deepest place that someone right. has been. The, right. um, it's, all of these regions are what we call the Mariana Trench, mm -hmm. which is in the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple other spots. Okay. And the guy who did Avatar, 
um, you know, like the, he's really into the ocean. Yes, he's really into the ocean. He used to hold a record where he went down to another place. Um, I think it was the Palau deep site. So they have gone way beyond that. That's no, okay. way, not way beyond, <laughs> but they have gone deeper than the 10,000 meters. Uh, more importantly, um, the, in Jamaica, I'm Jamaican, so most of my experience in life is from there. There is a, the University of the West Indies mm -hmm. does this thing. And they have a marine biology lab in Discovery Bay. And I'm from Montego Bay. There's a fish sanctuary, mm. the Montego Bay Marine Park, mm -hmm. because there is a, and you know, fish is, is an economic livelihood of people. Yes. You went to the Pacific, the South Pacific, mm -hmm. to do your research. Have you, one question is, have you done any um, investigation work in the Caribbean from? I have not. I have not personally done any research in the Caribbean. Um, but it, I've been to the Caribbean a couple times to do some diving. But I've never done research there. Actually, I am planning to do some research. Um, we just wrote a sizable grant with the Black and Marine Science team. And with that, we would actually be launching a um, citizen science program. But this would be closer to home in the Chesapeake Bay. And we see with a lot of citizen science programs, which are great, they're all across the globe. But even here in Philly, I'll go to a place and there aren't a lot of place, people who look like me. And so this program would be all about Connect interacting with, them. with folks in the Hampton Roads region. I just wanted to know um, what effect does the warming planet has on the coral reef? Oh, that's a great question. So you hear a lot about corals bleaching, right? How many people have heard that term coral bleaching? What the coral bleaching is, and so you saw in some of the photos, the corals were very colorful. They have a relationship with an alga. This algae is only one cell large. What happens is that algae photosynthesizes. And that's why a lot of these corals live very close to the surface. As they're photosynthesizing, they create a waste. The coral animal itself actually eats that waste. And this is a way to kind of um, compensate if there's not a lot of things living and not a lot of food in the water column that their polyps can pull down for them, which is mainly the case in coral reefs. When you use the term bleaching, it's almost like a coral is sick. And so it can be caused by a lot of different things. But what happens is this coral now expels that algae. They don't know necessarily the mechanisms as to why, but the algae leaves, and now that coral is white. Corals don't like really hot temperatures, and we're seeing that when the waters get warm, more of these corals are bleaching. And so when we talk about climate change, when we talk especially about a warming planet and a warming ocean, we can see that we're going to have more bleaching events. And we've, we already see this. We already see this in coral reef communities, where now we have corals that are bleaching more frequently, and some corals take hundreds of years to grow. So if you have a coral that's bleached, and now it's dying, and now it's dead in a couple of months, you know, it's going to be a long time for it to be replaced. Dr. Gaines, I have a question. Um, it's based on the Bible. In the Bible, there's an account of uh, a man, his name is Jonah, being swallowed by a fish. The Bible says that the Lord prepared a, gr prepared a great fish. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we'll see uh, books with a picture of a whale. Uh, my question is, are there any other kinds of uh, fish large enough to swallow a you know, full-size human being besides a whale? I don't know, and I don't think that we know between 5 to 10 percent of everything in the ocean. So I just say that to say there's a lot of room that there potentially could be. On the excursion that Dr. Dawn Wright is going to be on, they've already assumed they're going to find some species of fish, some species of octopi that they've never even seen before. Because every time they do a type of mission like this, they do. So there very well could be fish, could be organisms that large. Um, out there. Okay. Um, it seems like um, like du uh, places like Dubai and these other places around the world, 
sand seems to be like gold now because you have people with ships taking a lot of sand, removing sand from the ocean. Is that causing any type of problems also? Because you hear a lot about the removal of sand for big time corporations around the world. So, yeah, the removal of sand, so the movement of sand along the beach is a natural, it's natural, especially when we're thinking about how winds move and how currents and how the ocean itself. But when you do have large displacements of sand like that, it can have negative repercussions, but it just depends on where and how much. Um, along the coast of South Carolina and North Carolina, it's slightly tangential to what you're talking about. What they do is when they know a large storm is coming, they'll actually take sand deep in the ocean and bring it up to kind of prevent more damage from those coastal communities. Those are very temporary um, solutions and they can have more negative repercussions at, in the long term um, as compared to their, what they do in the short term. But that's also a, a class thing because there have been studies that show that they really do those type of uh, mitigations in communities that are um, affluent. And so communities that aren't, you don't see them doing, having a lot of the sand brought to the shore as a protection method. What will happen to us if we lose all the coral reefs in the world? Oh, it would be at a minimum, at a minimum, we would see extremely outrageous prices for fish and seafood when we go into the market. If, if we would even find some at all. Um, like I say, that one out of every three fish spends a portion of their life in a coral reef. And it can be, you know, when they're just really small babies, some fish go there to uh, mate and then they'll leave, you know, go somewhere else. Right? But if you don't have these hubs, there's going to be crazy repercussions for fisheries. And that doesn't even talk about the re repercussions for those communities that are going to be more directly impacted right? when it comes to tourism, right? when it Beaches. comes to storms. And that energy now from those storms are going to cause a lot more damage on land. And we already know that storms are happening more frequently, and they're much stronger. So it's like, it's like you know, it's just all these things. Um, that we see. Um, I'm glad he asked that question. I, I just remember, um, by us sinking ships and these different things to have core built, is that kind of counter negative? I mean, or because you know, it's, there's metal in the water now. I mean, but I don't understand that. You know, we will sink all these different things to create more coral reefs. Um, so why they sink core, uh, the, like ships, or like really anything that's hard like that, is because. Space is a hot commodity in coral reefs. Hard substrate at that. Like corals need some type of rock or something to kind of land on when they're really small before they can really start to grow big. And so when you're sinking like a ship or something hard like that, you're giving that community more um, hard substrate so the corals can come there hopefully. But it can't be only that, right? You have to also think about the water quality. You also have to think about um, where they are in the flow. And so if they're doing it for coral reasons, then they've thought about these things and they've picked sites for that. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll even have a hard substrate. And what they'll do is they'll um, give it a pulse of electricity and have it hooked up to it. And it sounds like it's, it's a complex process where they have it hooked up to a special system that actually gives a, a pulse of electricity which helps the corals to not only land there, but helps them to grow. So you have corals kind of like, they favor this place and now they're gonna grow larger. So um, to your last point, how do we make it, because e almost every profession probably looks similar to that chart that you show where we're one of, so how do we make it attractive? You know, we have Kimmy, Dominique, and Jordan. Young folks in here. <laughs> oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's so it is all it's already attractive, right? I've been able to travel the world. I scuba dive, right? I answer. I have a lot of autonomy in what I want to do, but it's really interacting with my colleagues and their their outlook, right? And so I don't think that the answer just lies within our community. Um, I think the masses in science have to change, and what we're what my goal is is the support, right? And so consistently telling folks who look like me, 
younger generations, you can do this. There are tons of opportunities, tons of paid opportunities. There's still a lot of money in science and the ability to really answer any questions, look in any, any system. So I think the foundation is just being curious. I am less concerned about the institutional uh, elements that block you know, people from moving forward. Within the black community, Jamaica, USA, wherever, water seemed to be an obstacle in people's minds. Are, people don't want to, people are afraid of the ocean. Black people are afraid of water. So we don't see a lot of um, black swimmers, for example, making the grade to the Olympics. But when they attempt it, they do well. So within our community, we need to start to encourage our young people to explore, expose them and explore whatever there is, and don't discourage them. Not because I may be afraid of the water, I go, I'm, I'm going to try and prevent my child and create that same fear in the child's mind. So we, I think we need to start, well, we have to look at it in, in a multifaceted way, but within the community. So that when you start to see an increased number of black folks start to push forward, then at the institutional level, some of those barriers must come down. But at the moment, it's a trickle of people pushing forward. So we need to encourage that. Hey. Now, I want to challenge in one thing, though. Within our church circle, I don't find a lot of people who are interested in um, the environment, mean protecting our environment. I don't find too, enough of the, us doing that. What the, my challenge to you is, I don't know where, where you are, but what can we do as a Christian community? What w would you suggest we do as a Christian community to enhance uh, the barren environment? What a, our own activities on the land affect what goes on there. Mm -hmm. the, God put man on the earth and said, take care of it. That's the philosophy I operate on. You, are, you have the experience. You see what's going on out there. Challenge us and tell us what we can do. I think the biggest thing is you have to see it, right? And so I think any opportunities that you have to interact with nature, to interact with your coastal system, right? It's all connected. I would encourage us to do that, right? And it makes sense, unfortunately, as why we don't see a lot of folks like us, especially where we live, right here in Philadelphia, doing these things. Because again, we were excluded. <laughs> we weren't supposed to be on beaches, right? They excluded us from places like that. Right? We were excluded from beaches. We were excluded from public pools for quite some time, even within the generation of my mom. Right? And sometimes it's wild for me to think about it in that context, but that's relatively a short amount of time. And so I think even if we just make the statement that we are there, there are times I've been diving, right? And someone, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? I have a whole school of gear on my back, like things like that. And it's clear to them that they don't think I should be there. But for me, it's like, I'm just doing my job. Like, this is what I've done thousands of times before, so why should I not have a place here? And so I think making that statement time and time again is very strong in any capacity. So any way that you can interact with nature, I think that's, 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 that's golden. And it also gives you more context. I feel like when you were talking about climate change, most people see they've been in a space for 10 years, 12 years, they see how it's changing in terms of, you know, the plants they see, the organisms they see, the temperature, right? It's not rocket science in terms of how the climate is changing. We all see these things, we feel them. So, and I think that just being able to, you know, to like see that and continue to develop relationships with our natural systems is just gonna make that even stronger. I just wanted to applaud you for what you're doing because we do narrow the 
the curriculum to when young people want to be scientists or when they want to study biology and chemistry and all the sciences, we limit their thinking to being doctors, you know, medical doctors. But I applaud you because you took that energy and put it into microbiology, which is what we do need black scientists for, and I applaud you. And I have a position for you to do something for me too. And I, I'm gonna, all of you aspiring scientists, there are tons of opportunities. If you're serious, like, come please talk to me. Even if you're slightly serious about it, like, come talk to me. There's tons of opportunities. Tons of opportunities, even today. There are more questions, more conservation than people actually applying it. So there's always a seat for you at this table. Make sure you heard. There's a question. Oh, from, we'll come back. Yeah, go Go ahead, and then I'm sorry, I'll come to you, sir. You kind of alluded to my question, uh, but uh, I want you to be clear that there are some who might want to work with marine, but they don't want to go to the water. I'm, I want you to talk about the supportive professional jobs that come with it, like data science or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That's my first part. And the second part is that while you said that there is a, a lot of money in terms of internship, I want you to be clear about the grants and scholarships that are okay. there for our, our people, especially when you find that they are either cut off because of other reasons like income and other things. How do these scholarships and grants, how are they given in such a way that they could be able to encourage our students? So this is again where black and marine science comes in because we have a whole list of scholarships I can also talk to you more specifically about the scholarships that I'm familiar with. Um, and a lot of times we see that these scholarships, at least from the conversations I've had with folks, they don't get a diverse pool of applicants. So it does start there, right, with how they're advertised. I think, especially when you're talking about the undergraduate level, there are a lot more opportunities. And you do have to be somewhat clever about, like you stated, data science, right? I am not a coder, a, a data scientist, but I do employ a lot of coding in what I do. And so there are people out there who you might not necessarily think, oh, this isn't for me, I'm into data science, or oh, this position isn't for me, or this scholarship isn't for me because I'm in this box. But the way that we study the ocean is very interdisciplinary. So most times you can make it work in terms of how you apply for these scholarships how you go about looking for grants. Um, I think it's slight, a little bit more challenging when you're looking at those early years in high school, when you're thinking about grants and scholarships. But in undergrad, there, there are many. The EPA, the National Oceanic Admi Atmospheric Administration, they both have a suite of scholarships that are specifically for people of color. But a lot of people, even I didn't know about a lot of them until I had gotten my degrees. And so again, it just goes back to that share of knowledge. And that's really another reason, I know I keep saying it, but that's why I'm really a part of the Black and Marine Science team too. That's why when my friend <laughs> texts me, that's how it started, hey, you wanna start doing this, you wanna be involved? We get in a team together. And I jumped on the opportunity because it's like, yes, like I would have loved to have something like Black and Marine Science, a community like that, where I could see the different um, opportunities. I was fortunate that I went to Hampton and there are a lot of um, opportunities just being there um, because they have a marine environmental science program and because it's somewhat known. So there are specific organizations that will pinpoint that. And so I just say that to say when you are going through the college, college process, make sure you talk with your professors and make sure that they're sharing this knowledge with you. That's a part of why they're there. I'm sorry, you had a question? From what I'm hearing, are the coral reefs like the rainforest of the ocean? Because <laughs> it, it seems like when there's more coral reefs, there's like abundance of life mm -hmm. that's there. And I, I see the same thing as the rainforest. Yes. So we hear a lot about the rainforest. Coral reefs are important. Um, but even if we look at the ocean at a much larger level in terms of the algae just within the ocean and how much carbon we're able to sequester, which we know that CO2 in the atmosphere, right, that makes, that's a part of why our ocean, our, I'm sorry, our atmosphere is warming. And so those communities are much more important than rainforests. And so there is a very strong correlation between 
the importance of certain communities, and I definitely think coral reefs are one of those, as well as the rainforest. But I mean, I'm biased, of course, and so of course I'm going to say that corals are a lot more important. But that's that's not the case. They all have some level of conservation that's needed. This young man has a question. You can also ask all right. me later too. What was the question again? All right, he wants to know what is the risk of injury, you know, in, in diving. Um, and and I'm, I might even piggyback on that. In your diving experiences, have you had any incidents where you felt, you know? Yeah, I've had one instance where, um, we, you know, we went down and we were like, no, we have, to, we have to get out. And it was really because the current was so strong. Um, and I'll be honest, uh, we knew a very large storm was coming to the island. So we were like, oh, we're going to try and get in there and do something, be, you know, put some stuff out there, collect some samples beforehand. So we had, like, in the back of our minds that this might not be the best, um, the best time. But my philosophy, especially now, as I'm more I get into it, there's no, the ocean's always going to be there. You know, it's not like tomorrow is going to, dry up so if we need to push a dive we need to push a dive um another like i said i've been diving thousands of times so i think just having that one experience is the odds are pretty good <laughs> um but i also don't take too many risks when i dive it's like with you know most things that you do in life like i'm not you know my tank is getting low i'm not going to try and you know let me just spend, no i'm all right let me get out of here i'll come back again um so i i kind of just put myself in my health first um, I had another situation, I wasn't diving, but I was in the ocean where I got stung by a box jelly. And so that was unfun, that was not fun. <laughs> um, but um, those are really the only two situations where I've been in the ocean and like, you know, I had to kind of jump out or like, oh, it wasn't safe for me to be there. Um, I'm sorry, this is interesting to me too. <laughs> um, Carbon dioxide, you mentioned that a little bit earlier before. Does the ocean absorb or give off? It, so it does both. Um, and most plants do too, right? They, but there's a net absorption of carbon dioxide. And so what happens is plants, just like we take in oxygen and we release CO2, they do that as well, but just not to the scale. And they really use the photosynthesis process or the process where they're using sunlight and they're using carbon dioxide to make sugars. And that's what really helps them to grow, helps them to survive. And, and that's what I'm thinking. If, if, we, if the ocean is so huge, and because I did hear about this somewhere before, and it, it, it takes, takes, it absorbs and gives up, but mostly absorbs. And if it gets more of the carbon dioxide, um, sometimes I, I wonder why we, we're saying more about climate change and different things. If, the, the ocean is so huge and it's taking in so much of that. But it, that also, so that process, um, the ocean has a very strict carbon cycle where when you have carbon dioxide coming in, it alters how that cycle is, how it moves. And at the end of that process, you can have more um, carbonic acid, which is an acid, which is not good. That acid for many organisms in the ocean can be detrimental. For corals, it can dissolve them, right? And so while, yes, it's a good thing that the ocean is what we call a carbon sink, where we have a lot of carbon taking it in, you know, nothing is, is permanent like that, where it's just all good, right? You have these repercussions where now we have an altered can, um, carbon cycle, and we can see the repercussions of that. Uh, just the depth of the ocean, right? When you go to a certain point, light doesn't penetrate, does it? Mm -hmm. and, and when you get to those points where, you, where somehow you have animals that still live down there? Well, the I, I don't do that. Most of my dives are relatively, sh actually extremely shallow. Um, but where Dr. Dawn Wright is going in Challenger Deep, so where she's going, she has to be in a very special, um, what they call submersible. Um, and even just to be in there, you know, it's, very, it's almost a perfect spe sphere. And they do it almost in a per perfect sphere because 
is able to tolerate the pressures at that depth, right? There's, it's very cold down there. It's about 40 degrees Celsius where she's, I'm sorry, 40 degrees Fahrenheit where she's going. But if she were to go deeper, it'd be even colder. And there are organisms that live down there. I would encourage you all, one of my favorite shows when we're talking about the ocean is um, Blue Planet. And they have a whole, whole episode that talks about the deep ocean and the organisms that live down there. And they actually went down on a, some, a uh, ship similar to what Dr. Dawn Wright is going on, but they also just deployed a um, ROV, remotely operated vehicle, which can go a lot deeper, and they just took photos, and they saw organisms. They saw worms that were like 10 feet long, right? They saw white crabs, like all of these things. And so the deep ocean, there used to be the thought that there was really nothing that lived there because of the t um, pressure and the temperature. But we know that that's not true at all. I, I, I have um, one other question, right? Those animals that live, all of, that um, they're adjusted to the pressure at that level. If you should bring them up to a lower pressure, would they explode? So there have been situations where that happens. What they'll do sometimes, um, at least with the submersibles, is they have like a an arm type deal, and they'll put that in a container that like is at a certain kind of pressure, and that's how they'll bring certain organisms up. It depends on what they want them for, um, on how they'll collect them. With okay. your mention. Um, excuse me. Can I see that? With your mention of the blue planet, I got to ask you, why is the ocean blue? Ah, does anybody know the answer to that, to that one? Huh? Section of the what? Reflection of the sky is what she's saying. No. That's, so there is, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that in the sense that there were some photos I showed you and you might have seen it was kind of just like gray washed it looked like where you couldn't really see colors. Some of them, other photos were like really brilliant in terms of the colors that you can see. And what happens is we have sunlight, right? And sunlight is comprised of different wavelengths. And that's how we have different colors that we're able to perceive. There are organisms that utilize that sunlight, right? But they pick and choose what rays they utilize. A lot of primary producers, what they do is they utilize wavelengths that are what we would consider red. They use reds, they use greens, they'll use oranges. They don't really use blues. And so what happens is as that light is coming into the ocean, you have organisms taking up all of the wavelengths they need. And when you get to certain depths, that's why things like, they almost look like a monotone color. But if you bring them up to the surface, you'll see they're like brilliantly orange or brilliantly red and stuff. It's because now at that depth, all you really have is those blue wavelengths. And so that's kind of why now you see, okay, that's the only thing that's really not being used and can be reflected back. And that's why we see it as blue. Um, <clears throat> I saw a program some years back about a, um, the dust storms from the Sahara that blows over into the West Indies were actually responsible for decimating the corals. you have anything to say about that? Yeah, so um, those, that phenomenon is very important because it gives the ocean iron. And so iron is what we call a limiting factor in the ocean where you just don't find a lot of it. So when you have an increase in iron, mo a lot of organisms like that, but also some bad organisms like that. And so you can have certain types of algal blooms when you have a lot of this iron coming in because algae can grow really fast. And algae is like really dynamic um, in a sense that some alga can actually, when they start to grow really fast, they actually make toxins. And so if you know of red tides in like the Gulf of Mexico region where they talk about how, oh, we can't fish. If you eat those fish, you yourself could get sick. Um, and so you can have phenomena similar to that as well happening when you have increases in iron. Okay. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I guess uh, we may. I have a question. I'll also stay around for a couple, like if you, you know, Ooh. so, you know, I understand y'all okay. all got stuff to do. So you keep talking about the ocean. The marine science activities that you are involved in, 
Does it involve, like, for instance, the Great Lake regions, which, are, which is fresh water? Uh, so. I, I like to say I'm salty. <laughs> so, okay. I'll, you know, in terms of the ocean all day, every day, I'm not necessarily someone who studies the Great Lakes or what we would call fresh water systems or even systems that might, you know, are landlocked that have some pools of salt in them. I don't necessarily... But when you talk about marine science, does it involve the fresh water or is it just the ocean? Um, usually it's just the ocean, but um, it's not necessarily, not necessarily. But the study of freshwater systems is known as liminology. And I say not necessarily because on the black and marine science side, we have members who consider themselves more freshwater, um, but we still, you know, they're members. And it makes sense, right? Most, all freshwater systems, right? They run off into some ocean. So there is at least some overlap that needs to happen. Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you decided to smash through the glass ceiling or whatever it is, the obstacles that you have to deal with yeah. as a black person. I commend you for that. Last question is, why South Pacific to do <laughs> research as opposed to the Caribbean? Um, it was really just the opportunities that presented itself at the time. Um, I could have done, easily done my research, you know, I was at UCLA, I could have done it in California, but it was just the opportunity that I took advantage of. Um, this is my last question, El Gordon. Oh. Um, El Golden takes care of freshwater fish, right, down, downstairs. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. You know, the fish will die. And you have individuals that have saltwater fish that they take care of mm -hmm. at home. And if you don't know what you're doing, that's an expensive fish mm -hmm. that you're going to kill. You know, and hearing all this and I'm thinking it through, you know, God has so much stuff in place that keeps the ocean so pH balanced. Am I saying the right word if I say pH? Mm -hmm. yeah. So pH balanced that you have everything there that's just living and if we don't do our part yes uh, you know they will die but god is still the overseer of all these wonderful sea creatures and the ocean is just so balanced that you could go diving and see all these creatures and who's who's taking care of it you know he is but then we can destroy it very easily Dr. Gannis, thank you for coming. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming, um, her dad and sister and brother. And uh, we really, truly enjoyed your presentation. Um, she was supposed to bring a diving suit, but it needed to have um, uh, maintenance. I was looking forward to that because I was planning to go dive in a little lake but not with the sharks. No, not either. I may, I may die with the shark because I sink easily. Thank you again for coming, and uh, you know we look forward to uh, maybe even having you back uh, again. I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, you know, as a matter of fact, you may be hearing from me for another, uh, you know. But she was at um, the Huntington Valley Christian Academy a few weeks ago, and she's now at Willow Grove. It's, she's very busy. She's getting ready to go to Jordan uh, if it, everything goes well um, to do some diving again. So she gets to travel all over the world. Um, that's, that's probably one plus for, the, for your, that type of a job. For the young people, if you like to travel and see different places, you know, marine science, black and marine science, maybe your, you know, your key. So I want to thank Dr. Gaines again for coming. And uh, thank you.
So we're going to end this program with a short prayer, and I, I don't know if Ella Smart is going to do the Bible study after this. But um, I, I don't want to say, well, he's going to, we'll find out. But so let's pray, for, uh, folks. Father, we thank you for Dr. Gaines and her presentation here today. We pray that you will bless her as she continues to teach and in, continues to encourage young people and old people about this important work uh, in safeguarding the oceans and studying the various creatures in it that God has created. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, where is he at? Oh, no Bible study? Well, if not, I don't know if you want to stick around and ask her and meet her and talk to her personally. Um, but there won't be any Bible study today. <laughs>